The presentation, uh, the keynote presentation, is by uh, Jesus uh, Gonzalez Barahona from the University of Rey Juan Carlos uh, in Madrid. Actually, it's not in Madrid itself; it's uh, in south. It's in the south. Uh, so he's leading the LibreSoft research group, or co-leading. Uh, I guess it's together with Gregorio that you're co-leading the group. Um, and he's also uh, he, he's the um, founder or co-founder, I don't know, of Bitergia company, which is also involved in the chaos community. You're also a member of the chaos community. So it looks like, like you were a perfect fit for giving a keynote for, uh, for today. <laughs> I leave the floor open to uh, Jesus for his keynote presentation. Thank you very much. So it's still enough? Uh, well, thanks a lot for inviting me this morning. I've been working in topics related to software health for many years, even when we did call it software health. And first of all, I was starting uh, um, to work in this uh, um, by chance because we started to study uh, Debian and the Debian packages for different reasons. And at that point, we were basically just counting lines of code to see how big uh, Debian was. But obviously, that, that was not that interesting. So at that point, we were starting to retrieve information for uh, all the um, software repositories that are around. And we started to find out with many other people around the world that in the software development repositories, there was a lot of information that could be used to understand how communities were developing software. With time, those same tools that the free open source software communities were using during the 90s and the early uh, 2000s uh, started to become common in the industry too. Uh, nowadays, many people are using things like uh, GitHub Enterprise, for instance, or uh, Atlassian tools, which are the tools that the free software community were using like 10 years before. So basically, the tools that we had are as useful for analyzing software in companies. And in the end, many of the concepts are uh, similar. The main difference when we came to um, communities in open source projects is that the community itself we has a different rules than the teams working within companies. But at the same time, uh, a lot of the traditional open source software communities have started to be uh, um, very uh, of interest for many companies, so that companies are also acting in these communities, to the point that companies are becoming actual actors, not only uh, somebody that hires developers, but actors that can drive the project in many, from, uh, many reasons, so that the intersection between companies and individuals is also quite interesting. And, and this is like the landscape <laughs> that I'm, I'm researching for, for some years. Uh, some years ago, we also started a, a, a company to uh, do exactly this, retrieve data from repositories and try to get insights about how software is being developed, both in uh, communities and in companies. And during, during this personal journey, I was working in several projects, many during the, during the 2000s, where we were exploring the concept of software health. And it, I think it was one of the first time that we started to think of, uh, about the health of a project, about something more than purely technical. Because uh, when you are working in a project, as you all know, it's not only uh, the, the technical abilities of the community. It's also how that community is attracting people. It's how communities are allocating, getting resources, whatever. How the community is producing different kinds of staff so that the software is more usable, from documentation to, to marketing. And it's also how the community is competing with other communities and other projects. Because the community is not isolated, it's in a good ecosystem where there are a lot of products, a lot of different communities, and all of them are competing for many things. Not only competing because I want my project to be the best one and I'm competing for users, I'm also competing for developers, because other developers could be interested in joining a, a similar community by doing better for some reason, or, or perceived as, as being doing better. So in any case, what I'm going to try to present today is, first of all, um, my idea about what software health is. Uh, having into account all of this, and I'm also trying to, I'm going to try to show you several models uh, that were produced during the last 30 years, uh, where we have been dealing with that from the one point or, or, of view or, or another. So in the end, uh, what is health? Even if you talk about health in humans, that's very difficult to say. If I want to say who is healthy in this room, well, maybe we are all healthy to some extent because we are here, we are alive, we can talk and everything. But if, uh, you know, if, if we start to, to, to dig a, a bit deeper, somebody is having a headache. Somebody is having maybe a bit of temperature today. Maybe somebody is jet lagged. I am. 
So, uh, mm -hmm. w what exactly is being healthy? So, first of all, it depends a lot on uh, the person who feels or not healthy, and then depends on how do you find health. And if you talk to 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 a, to a doctor, for instance, it's, it's very likely going to have a very a much much more precise uh, definition of what we can consider as health. And the second one is: Is anyone healthy? So, when we say a project is healthy, for instance, what we really mean? Because we can always improve. You can always be better. So, what does it mean to be healthy? To be sustainable in time, to be producing everything the in the best uh, efficient way, to be attractive to developers, depending on whom you ask, the ways of improving health are also different. Some project may be interested in, we want to attract developers, so we want to, 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 to define health as being able of attracting new developers. Some other may define that in terms of the product. We want to produce a, a nice, useful, good quality product. So we consider to be healthy if we can do that. And um, there are many other ways of looking at that. But uh, the most common one, when, when we say, is to define as a community, as a company, as a stakeholder, what do we want? But the problem is, it's difficult to know what we want. So this is a joke that we have for, for our famous uh, Spanish uh, humorist, which is, what do we want? We want patient, but we want it right now, which is, Something that happens a lot. So if, if you let communities and companies and even individuals uh, think a bit about what do they want, that's not that easy to know. And uh, in particular, that's something that evolves over time. And that's something that different people in the same community may perceive in different ways. Even the same people, when ha is having different roles, may see in different ways. I've been talking to developers in many cases, and they have a personal view of the project, a company view of the project, and in many cases a community view of the project. And all of them are different, and, 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 and this is a problem for themselves, because they need to mix everything together and try to act according to that. And of course companies would like their developers to act exactly like the company wants, but developers are humans and they have a different way of understanding the health for the project and the things that are healthy for the project, and they also do their own staff, let's say. And uh, that means that even when you came to do a very simple definition like how do we want to improve the health of our project? And everybody in the room is interested in the project. Still, you have a lot of many different opinions. So in theory, if you look at the, at the product, remember that these are not communities for fun or something like that. Maybe have people is having fun, but the main end of these communities is to create software. So in the end, the idea is, is the software useful at all? Is the software in the end of good quality? Again, for some definition of quality, which is difficult to probably agree on, but basically people usually agree on the, we have some requirements, so uh, the software should be uh, working according to those requirements. It should be cheap to maintain or easy to maintain, define it wherever you want. It should be easy to use, it should be performing according to specifications, and it should have good performance. And many other things that are usually related to the quality of the software. So in some sense, one could say, well, we want software of good quality. That, that's a theory, at least. And, and if you look at many quality models, they basically focus on, we want to reach that. But in practice, especially in open source software, in many cases, uh, there is a shallow verification of the functionality. In fact, in many cases, it is not clear at all which functionality is expected from the program. Uh, requirements, maybe they are non existent maybe they are incomplete. It, maybe they are in the minds of the developers, but there are not, not, not that much formal documents. Maintainability in many cases is very expensive, even when the project is trying to get it to, 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 to a certain limit. Usability, you now have many facets and many different ways of looking at it, so it's difficult to define. And performance is only a relative target. If, if, the, if the program is not uh, uh, functioning according to specifications or according to what people expect, the performance thing is not important. Of course, when it is performing perfectly, performance is also an issue. But in any case, all of this is mixed together. And uh, the problem is that it's very difficult to define quality in terms of things that are really not mm -hmm. perfect. And you need to decide which of them you want to improve. And again, different stakeholders may want to define different things. So in the end, what means good enough, which would be healthy? So it depends a lot on the people saying, this is good enough for me, or good, good enough for my, my, my interests. So. Uh, Let's devote a moment to improving quality. Because for many years, quality has been one of the aspects studied by software engineering. And we have models and everything for that. And um, 
If we understand what the, let's say, traditional research on uh, software failure did, we can understand why we need something else. And, and that's how we come to the concept of health. Because if you look, look at the traditional uh, software quality uh, texts from, I don't know, the last 30 years, they don't really talk about uh, health. They talk about quality. And they talk usually about process or product quality. In fact, you have these two traditional approaches. One is, the important thing is the product. And uh, we want to define quality for the product. And you have several models, starting from the ISO ones and, and some others. And then you have process quality. Process quality assumes that if you follow a quality process, the product, the, the product is going to have quality too. Uh, of course, this, this is something which is pretty much discussed. Both whether we can really have quality models for products only, and whether following the rules of some of these quality product, pro, project, sorry, um, quality processes is going to produce a, a, good pro, a, a, a good product in there. But basically, this traditional research assumes that if you know how to produce software and you follow the rules, the software is going to have good quality. And, and, and that's a general idea that has driven research in the area for many years. And then you have, for instance, uh, CIS Cube, which is a quality model for code, which is uh, quite related to some ISO recommendations. And it basically uh, works in uh, four different areas, reliability, efficiency, security, and maintainability, and tries to define how the product should be in terms of those. And then you basically try to rank in which, at, at which level of reliability, efficiency, security, or maintainability is my, my, my product. And then you define how much quality has the product based on that ranking or, 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 that, on, or that evaluation. And for each of the different areas, you have very specific things that you can look in the code. For instance, uh, probably you cannot read from there, but for reliability, you can say uh, protecting store in multi-threaded environments, for instance. So that's the kind of thing that you should be looking in the source code. And the assumption is, if you do all this, well, the product is having good quality. But if you look at the complete uh, uh, standard, it's not clear at all that you're really having a good product if you are doing all of that stuff. That's my very personal opinion, but that's also something that you can um, get yourself if you go on and have a look at the, at the complete thing. Because, in my opinion, it is missing a lot of stuff, which is not exactly directly to the source code of the product. Which means that maybe the source code can be perfect from this point of view and still not being usable for a certain person. Which means that the quality from that point of view is, is not telling me the, the kind of information that I want. You want it to see. Is this an ISO standard? I've never seen it. It's, it's related to an ISO standard. This is basically produced by the same people that did CMM. Wow. And I introduced it because it's simple enough. Because the ISO standards, you know, they are like, I don't know, several hundred pages. But this is nice in the sense that. It, it can be summarized in, in this chart, which is like one page, and, and, and then you go through the details. So, if we agree that this is not the right approach now, and overall that it's very difficult to apply that to communities, there is another approach that started more than 20 years ago, which is we are not saying what is quality, but we are going to try to find out in the community, in the processes, and in the, in the code, uh, indicators for quality. So things like, if we find this, we can consider probably this is having better quality than if we don't find this. It's a, a different approach because the idea is not say, follow the rules and you are going to have a good project. It's, I'm going to look at your project and I'm going to say what I find and I can tell you where to improve. Because in this and these areas, you are low, maybe you can improve if you want. And you can decide which areas are important for you. Because if you don't care about this area and you are very low in that, in that area, that's not the problem. So the, the, the idea here is, instead of uh, improving the software per se, the, uh, and telling people how to produce the software, the idea is to know about how the software is produced. And to know as much as possible. To the point that some of these quality models even are not saying this is good, this is bad. They are just saying you are doing this or you are doing this. Because in many cases there are decisions that for some people may be good, for some people may be bad. For instance, uh, corporate diversity. Some people think that's very good because there are many companies uh, uh, driving the project and that's good, nobody's controlling it. Some others say that's a problem because all of them need to reach consensus, they have different business models, different uh, business targets, and that's going to be uh, a mess for the project, and it's very difficult to say. So I don't know the answer. But if you uh, agree 
and with any of these opinions, the important thing is to know for a given project which one is the company diversity. And then you can decide by based, based on that whether this fits your needs, fits your ideas, fits your targets, or, or, or not. Um, for this, the idea is to focus on some things that you can do when you have the data. One of the things that started all of this is comparison. And the idea is, I'm in a company and I need to decide between several similar projects. From the functional point of view, all of them could fit. But I have some other goals that I want to analyze on the projects, which are not strictly functional, and I want to decide by based on them. For instance, I, I, I'm very much interested in long-term support because I'm uh, writing software for putting a train, and this is going to be in the train for 20 years. And I need to know that there are going to be new releases of this thing for the next 20 years because I want things like uh, security bugs fix, for instance. And uh, from that point of view, I may be comparing five different projects, and one has a yeah, very strong community supported by other companies, and the others not. So maybe I'm saying, well, I'm going to take this one because of this strong support by the community and the companies, which seems to suggest that this product is going to be here in the future. But that, that's only one of the things that you can think of. But the idea is, I want to compare similar projects and decide which one fits better my target. And my targets may be business targets, maybe uh, anything uh, that, that is important to me. Another one is tracking. If I'm in a community or I'm a, st uh, a stakeholder of a, of, a, of a community or a project, in many cases what I want to do is to track whether the project is getting better or not. Again, for some metrics of okay, okay. better. So for instance, one human metric is how many people is involved in the project, how many people are actually building the project. I want to have some sustainability, so I need developers working a score in the project. I don't want a lot of people leaving the project and not new people replacing them and stuff like that. So for that, I, I can track simple metrics like how many people is involved in building most of the software. And I try to see whether that's improving or not. And if I'm a stakeholder in the project, maybe I'm a company interested in the project, I can try to hire more developers, for instance or I can try to be more attractive. Or maybe I decide, if I'm a personal developer, an individual, I may decide to go to somewhere else because this is no longer uh, feeding my needs. And uh, for communities, self-awareness is also quite important. And many projects have started to do this, or, or some kind of these metrics, just for self-awareness, for knowing how the community is working. And that's something that nowadays is becoming common in the boards of many projects. So they want to have some idea of the health of the project to some extent. And again, depending on the different uh, goals that the different stakeholders have. But also at the, at the developer level, it happens the same. Because in many projects, especially where companies are not that relevant, developers themselves are taking the, 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 the decisions. And for, taking good, for making good decisions, they need to have an idea of the health of the project. And uh, something that I forgot to say, in all of these cases, if you are a real expert in the project, you know the project uh, from um, all the points of view, Probably there is nothing that an external assessment can tell you that you don't know. But in the first case, for instance, usually you are not a complete expert in the project. You are somebody's external, and you want to analyze the project from an external point of view. So you, you cannot invest in uh, um, now in with perfect detail all the projects that are involved in your product. That maybe are hundred of them. In those other cases, maybe the project is just too complex. If the project is ten people, don't bother. You are one of the 10 people, you know perfectly what's happening. But if the project is 1,000 people, and many projects are 1,000 people, it's impossible that you know what, what's, what, what's happening in the project. To the detail, to know whether we are improving or not, for instance, especially over a short period of time. And remember that you want to detect problems the sooner the better. So if we are starting to decline in new membership, for instance, we want to know it now, knowing one year where maybe we cannot do anything at all because the project uh, is no longer sexy and there is no way of attracting new people. So um, there are also uh, um, uh, other people, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, other subjects. We are talking about processes and products, which is the traditional approach for quality. But uh, when you are talking about community, you also have people. And you have people from two points of view. One is uh, the, the builders, the people doing the community. And the other one is the people evaluating the community. As I've been said all the time, uh, evaluators have different goals, different ideas. Evaluators can also be within the community, can be a stakeholder of the community, of course. But still, when they are evaluating, they may have different goals than when they are the people building the software, the people uh, actually in, in the community. So uh, for the builders, uh, they are especially important in, in free open source software 
Remember that in projects, people came and go just because they want. And companies came and go just because they want. There is usually no contracts. There is usually just a few formal relationships. So it's, it's very important that uh, the diverse people that are in the, in the, in the, in the project find ways of uh, working together. But they, they have different motivations, different agendas. And uh, so they, they need to build this sense of community and they need to build an analysis of the sense of the community. And they need to find out a kind of a consensus of all, which ones are the problems for my uh, project and how can I fix them. And that's where software health start to play a role because the idea is, in the end, what they are trying to evaluate is, do we have temperature? Do we have a headache today? Are we uh, stressed? How can we fix that? And uh, that's exactly the kind of things that we think of when we are thinking of uh, about our outcome. And from the point of view of the evaluators, that's where we find the different definitions for good. Because different evaluators have different ideas, different goals, different interests, and uh, they want to do the evaluation for a different thing. And it's very, difficult, different, very different the people doing an evaluation to select the software for being used in my system then the evolution that the, sorry, that the evaluation that the company involved in a community is doing what they need to decide whether I'm going to still be involved next year or not. And uh, those evaluations are way different. And still we have a lot of context around this. So it's not only the product, it's not only the, the, the process and, and the community. It's also the legal environment, which licenses they are using. Do we have uh, problems with patents, for instance? Do we have uh, problems with some legislation in some part of the world because of anything that my software is doing? Uh, do we have problems with how we hire people and, or we have, uh, or how we are uh, involved in the community via the companies? Uh, uh, support. How are is the community providing support? Support is in many cases provided by third parties, by companies, which may be external to the community. But this is fundamental for adopting of the software. If there is no support or little support, many companies are not going to consider it. Uh, economy, of course. How the uh, community gets resources in the end. Is companies putting money and putting developers, or is volunteers working and finding um, free time somewhere? Uh, how that uh, evolve? How is the people getting money from the software reverting to the community or not? How is this going to be sustainable in the future? And of course, the ecosystem. And in this case, I understand the ecosystem as the set of projects related to this, to this one. Related both because they are collaborating with this one. So think of Genome, for instance. Genome is a big community, but there are many sub-communities for each of the different products in Genome. In the end, all of them are collaborating, but in some sense, they are also dependent on the others. Because, for instance, if the lower levels of Genome are not working properly, all the applications are going to suffer. And the other way around, if the applications are not improving as much as, uh, as needed, it doesn't matter whether the lower levels are perfect, because nobody is going to use Genome because they are using the applications. But at the same time, you have competing ecosystems. If you are in Genome and you have been here for two years, you know that there is Kiri. And Kiri is basically in the same domain. And that doesn't mean that they are competing like companies compete. They compete in a different way, but they still compete. And they need to have Genome being used instead of Kiri, or at least they need to track what Kiri is doing, because otherwise users at some point are going to switch. So the, the ecosystem may be very complex, and uh, it's usually not that clear. So for instance, all of them also depend on Linux, because they are mostly running on Linux. So that means that they also depend on the Linux ecosystem, for the good and for the bad. And again, that means that they have a lot of dependencies with the systems competing with Linux. And Genome has been ported to all the systems, but Linux still is the, 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 the first platform. So uh, the, the ecosystem can be really complex. From the point of view of studying it, usually we need to partition and decide, well, we think that this is the, the, the barrier where most of the influence came from. But we need to be careful because in many cases we forget obvious things, like everything runs on Linux, so everything depends on that. Or that very small package that all of us are depending on and at some point has a security flaw. That means that all the programs depending on it has a security flaw. And maybe that's a very small component of the ecosystem that nobody knew because it's just a couple of developers working in free time. But it's basic for the whole uh, people using it. So that's why this is uh, uh, quite complex. And that's why, uh, uh, as, as Tom said, I think there's a lot of research to be done how the ecosystem is influencing the health of the specific uh, products. So uh, now I'm going to devote some minutes to 
go through some of the uh, quality models that try to address this. So one of the first ones that I know is OpenBRR. Open, uh, OpenBRR were, were done by some people who are all sort of well known now, including some companies. And the idea that they had was, let's look at how free software can be useful for companies. And that's it. So the idea is how free software, when you come to a corporate environment, is going to find, uh, let's say, use. And for that, they decided that they wanted to have some characteristics in the, in the software. And if the software didn't have that, those characteristics, it was very unlikely that the company uh, was willing to adopt the software. And they defined in a model where they have things like functionality, but also quality defined it over mainly over the product, support, community, adoption, usability, and some other things. And the idea was that they already were thinking about this idea of different stakeholders have different ideas, because you had quite important uh, a step where you basically weight the different areas with different uh, numbers. Which means that, for instance, maybe for my company, adopting is not important. So I'm not, in, I'm, I'm not interested. Maybe if I'm the only user in the world, that's good enough for me. For some other company, on the contrary, that's a very important signal because that means that uh, there's going to be a lot of support, whatever, and they want to measure it like half of the uh, complete quality. So basically what they came out was with a, a spreadsheet, which is what's basically the model, where you had all of the metrics that they consider important. Each of the metrics may uh, influence more than one category. And then you define it in, in a part of the spreadsheet, the, the numbers for the different importance for the different areas for you. And basically that provided a, a rating at the end, from one to five. Which basically meant five, this is perfect for my, for my goals. One meant uh, this is uh, very difficult for my goals. And uh, it was very simple. If, uh, the spreadsheets are still in the internet if you look for them. And uh, the nice thing of this model is that you read it and in half an hour you have to understand the model. And maybe you uh, don't agree with the metrics they use. But even though, you can change the metrics, of course. And you can have a derivative model of this one. It's very simple, but if you are doing a simple evaluation of products for being used in my company, this is the first step. And that was exactly for what it was de uh, designed. Because the idea of OpenBRR is, if I have competing products and I need to select for my company which one uh, is the, the best one, assuming all of them are good from the point of view of functionality, but the still functionality is one of the aspects, well, I'm going to run through this and get the numbers and try to define which one is the important one. And yeah, please. So do you think that there is like a little bit of a, when I use like an open BNR based on one product, let's say MySQL, mm -hmm. and use that product in one particular domain of the industry, mm -hmm. do you think that the open BNR would give a little bit of a similar metric, similar sort of readings? I think, uh, in fact, they still have, well, not they, but the, the the Wayback Machine, probably you know it, have analysis of several products that they did like 20 years ago. One of them is MySQL against, um, what's the name of the other database? In Postgres? Exactly, Postgres. And uh, it's an analysis of all of these aspects. And again, uh, if you look at it, probably it seems reasonable even 20 years later. And my impression is the number by itself is not that relevant. The comparison of the numbers is relevant. If you are deciding I want to use MySQL or not, maybe you need to use some other model. Because that's only going to say you oh, this is three, but what do you with that? But if you're doing an analysis according to, to certain weights here, and you're analyzing MySQL and PostgreSQL, and one says five and the other one says three, well, very likely you should be using the one with five, because there are reasons for that. And, uh, and remember that the main thing about this is not yet to give you a decision, it's to give you an instrument for the decision. So in the end, that should go to a kind of a committee or whoever is, taking the, is making the decision. And this is just one of the information. Maybe they need MySQL for other reasons, even if a PostgreSQL go to rank it better. But, but you better now, because at, at that point, you also know the risks. You know where the other product is, is bad for, for you. There was, sorry, so there was um, how, how much do I need to turn the numbers in this model to arrive at the opposite decision? So in the end, you should be defining the numbers at the beginning. You are the stakeholder. So you, you, you can, I mean, you can do whatever you want with the numbers. And you can just reverse them to get a good result. But if you are the stakeholder, you are the one interested in not doing that. You know, because, because that's, that, that's what people very often do. So yeah, you know in some way what you of like, course. and then you use a model and turn the numbers until it fits the decision. So I'm, I'm yeah. curious as to how 
useful you think such models are. So my impression is, uh, and the model was designed to you first do the weights and then do the analysis. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can do it the other way around, but in that case, probably it doesn't make sense that you make the analysis. Uh, what I mean is, you can fool yourself, but or, or you can try to defend a position in a meeting or whatever. But uh, the idea is, if we can agree of this in a meeting, for instance, and then, of course, a part of this is also qualitative. So, if uh, something gets a five or a three in uh, functionality, well, but assuming that you are an expert in this and you are given a set of weights, you should be able of doing an evaluation and say, okay, according to what you told me as a customer, this is the evaluation I can give you. And then you do with it whatever you may want. But the idea is to have something more than opinions on the table when you are discussing. So who is the primary user of this? How, who is supposed to be using the model? Comparing products. Well, first of all, the model is very old. I think that we got more sophisticated, but I think of the early uh, 2000s. And the idea was to uh, find out between different products no, which I mean, ones should be the most. user, is it going to be? Uh, a mainly, mainly corporations. Right, but inside the corporation, who's the person? I don't think that was defined, but basically the people making the decision for adoption of the product in the company. Right. Depending on the company, that made it maybe done at different levels. And probably different levels are going to set different weights here too. Right. But you know, in some cases it's the engineers making the decision. In some other cases that's, uh, that's high in the, in the corporate ranking, sir. Depends on the kind of... Uh, of, uh, of so this tool. was not specified in the model who this is for? I don't remember it, what it was. Okay. okay. In any case, the model is quite simple, so it's right. not, it's like five pages or something like that, so on, on the spreadsheets, which means it's also quite uh, quite easy to understand, but also quite easy to customize to your needs, if you want. And still, it's probably one of the easier to understand models over these 20 years. Well, let's move to another one. This is European, and this is uh, QSOS, and it was uh, developed by uh, Atos Oritin. I was related to, to the guys that were doing this like 10 years later, so I know some of the insights that they had and I know that this model was quite inspired by OpenBearer, but they had a bit of a different goals. Uh, basically, their idea was um, maybe because of what we yes, uh, were talking now about um, you can fool the numbers. The idea was to have a complete process where you were evaluating, getting a qualification, selecting, and defining. The idea was that you started by defining. You started by defining what you want. Defining was basically defining weights in the model. It's a bit more than that, but it's basically defining your goals and whatever. Then with those, you evaluate. You get metrics and uh, opinions on the community that you were, communities that you were evaluating or products that you were evaluating, and you created an ID card. The ID card was basically a summary of the community. And the idea is after that, you look at the different evaluations that you have done. You came to a, to a kind of a consensus uh, uh, system. Many people could be doing the same. And you try to qualify and select the product by setting that. If you couldn't find an agreement because there were different evaluations and they were way different, then you were supposed to come back to the definition and try to be more precise on the definition and then do the process again. So I'm not saying that this was working, but this was the idea. So the idea is if I agree on the first step, that's, uh, that's it. But if not, I need to define more precisely what I did because somebody said that, I don't know, usability is five, but the other one said usability is one which means we are not agreeing on that, so we, do, we need to define more precisely what is uh, usability. To the point where the community decided, okay, we are done. Um, they escorted mainly functional coverage risks from the customer perspective, and they had also this risk from Atos origin, but this was just because it was a commercial product by uh, Atos, and, and they wanted to do this kind of, of uh, evaluation. As far as I know, they didn't, so I think this was a affiliate business for them. Um, they had a more complex model, so this is only a part of the model. And they were looking at many different uh, aspects. Some of them are basically the same that you find in OpenBR, but some others are different. So for instance, they were entering into more details and they thought about things like intrinsic robustness. And, and, and for that, they talk about maturity, adoption, development roadmap, activity, and development independence, for instance. And for all of them, they gave a rank. Uh, but the ranking was also something that you could modify. And for instance, uh, if you are not interested in developing in independence, you could say, I'm a, as a customer, that's not something that bothers me, so I want that to rank that, that, that that's, that's not important. There were uh, many others, but they would say this is a more detailed evolution of the other model. And uh, in the end, what they did is to produce not only a number, but several numbers. 
This is the comparison of, uh, again, MySQL and PostgreSQL. It's uh, still on the net, so you can also look at the, at the full numbers. And uh, the idea was, in all of the different areas where we are doing the evaluation, we try to show which one is stronger than the other. And of course, you can agree with this specific or not, or with, sorry, with this specific evaluation or not, but their idea was, if I'm comparing several products, I can have an idea of how they compare in several areas, and then I can use that to make the decision. Because the, the basic assumption is, I cannot give a single number, because a single number is not going to capture the complexity of the, of the, of the community and the product. So I'm going to give several numbers, and then I have to decide. Maybe this product is bad here, but very good here, and the other, the other way around. So I need to decide which one is better for me in those, in those conditions. Then, and this is the, the last one, this is a, a recent uh, model. This is the Polarsis quality model. Polarsis was a, a, a group in Eclipse until uh, three months ago, I think, or something. And they were working for a long time, and the, the main interest of Polarsis is in long-term sustainability for open source software. And uh, the goal was to find out a quality model that could uh, inform companies that are installing software that is going to be in, uh, in production for 20, 30 years, how to decide now, because the decision now is going to influence the product for a lot of time. And they wanted to be very careful on that and so on. Uh, the, the interesting thing for the, for the, uh, from the point of view of the model, from my, my point of view, is that they split quality exactly in the three things that we are talking, ecosystem, processes, and product. Ecosystem includes basically all the context. And for all of them, they are finding different metrics, uh, sorry, different uh, goals that they consider important. So, uh, these basically are the goals that they are thinking in, are, are important when taking, making the decision. So, for instance, we have here activity, diversity, responsiveness, support. In the case of the processes, we have configuration management, change management, planning management. Processes about how the software is produced, remember? So, it's, what the idea was how the different tools and processes in the, in the, in the production process are working. And the product is availability, changeability, reliability, some other stuff like that. So uh, these were the goals. And then from that on, they followed a goal question metric uh, um, um, methodology to define the metrics. So they tried to find out which are ones are the metrics that they can get from repositories. Some of the other metrics are qualitative, so you need an expert to uh, assess on them. And uh, in the end, you define the questions that you are defining with those metrics. So in this schema, these are the goals I have, these are the questions, and here I have the metrics. As usual, in some cases, you have several metrics affecting one of the questions. And the idea was, if I can produce all of this, I can get an idea of, remember, the health of the system, or how suitable it is for my use in the future. But one of the nice things is that in this model, you can wait at any level. So that the idea again is that before you start, you define what's important for you. And you try to find out according probably to the experience of the company or to the whatever of the company, or all of this is weighted. And you define the weights, and then you run the metrics. Like 80% of the metrics can be run automatically. For the rest, you need an expert doing the assessment. Uh, the, the, another interesting thing is that since it's so much automated, the numbers are the numbers. Maybe you don't agree with them, but they are difficult to discuss. Probably if you don't like the numbers, that's because you didn't use the right weighting on the different metrics. And, and yeah, is it this, that uh, this uh, was discontinued three months ago? The group was discontinued. The model is still there. There is free software implementing this to some extent. And uh, sorry, they are still using the model. Or? I don't know if the companies are using the model because the, the model was produced in that context, and the company seemed to be happy with it. But they don't know if they adopted mm -hmm. it. Uh, I, I've been working with them for like one year, but they're not following the the, the, the complete development. I know there is a small company that did an open source product implementing it, and the software is still there. The company is called Castalia, if somebody wants to do it. And, and basically, the business now of the, that small company seems to be running this model for companies. But I don't know how successful they are or not. The, 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 the product is basically allows you to, to give the weights in a, in a website, and then the, to run, given the names of the repositories and so on, uh, to run and get the quality. So some, it's, it's partly manual. But well, and all of this said, so remember we started to look at the traditional approach for quality, then we started to talk a bit about health, and I showed you some models of um, software health. Now, this is my personal <laughs> definition of health. So this is where things start to become personal. 
So um, I think that when you are defining health, you are talking about characteristics. And remember, we are not talking about healthy. We are talking about health. So things that influence in your health. So we're talking about characteristics of a project and the context of the project, which is determining the capacity of producing software of good quality, because in the end, that's what you want. And remember, again, we are not a community of fan. We are communities of uh, software. So the idea is if the community is very healthy, but it's not producing software, then probably you need to re redefine health. Because in the end, what you need to do is to produce software. And of course, according to certain criteria, and here is where I put the subjectivity of the evaluator. Because different evaluators may think of different uh, projects or products or whatever in many different ways. And uh, in the end, the idea is each of these things is something that may be different for different people. So the first important thing for, from this definition is that software is a project thing, not a product thing from a point of view. Uh, even when you are interested in the quality of the software, the health which is interesting is the health of the group of people producing the software. In the same way that we don't talk about the uh, health of the table, but somebody did the table. Mm -hmm. And we may be interested in the health of the company doing the table, but not the health of the table. The, we would, could be interested in the quality of the table, but those are different things. Um, so for that, Basically, what we would be needing to define the health of a project is, first of all, the criteria to define quality, the characteristics that allow for that quality, and the time spot for measuring. And of course, the quality, uh, sorry, the health in different points in time may be widely different. When I say the characteristics for the, for allow, uh, to allow for, for that quality, uh, is probably the tricky part. Because the same way that we can say, well, this person is healthy or not, or which is the health of this person, Usually we talk in terms of how that person feels or what problems that person has. We can say, has a headache. But how do I know as an external observer that that person has a headache? For instance, when we are talking about health, you know what doctors do. They do analysis, they take temperature. Those are the indicators that I can look at. Those are the characteristics that I can look at. And of course, mapping characteristics to problems is a problem in itself. And that's why, in my opinion, in many cases, we don't agree on the different weights for the different things. It's not because we don't agree on the goals, it's because we don't agree on how the different things affect to the goals, affect to what we want. And some people may say diversity is not important, I don't want to measure that. And that's because they don't think that diversity has an impact on the product. But some other people may say, I'm very interested in diversity. And that's not only for philosophical reasons, that's because I think that is having an influence in the product. And the thing is, how we know? And the answer is research. And that's where I think that researchers can do a lot of things. Because people tend to confuse measuring things with getting a result of how those things influence. The, the important thing, which to remember, is the quality of the software being produced. So my impression is that our, paper, our, our role as researchers is mainly trying to find out which indicators, which characteristics are relevant, and finding proof as much as possible that those characteristics really influence the goals that we have. So that, for instance, we don't need to discuss whether diversity is affecting the product or not. Because we can say, look, some people three years ago wrote this paper, we did their sample, whatever, and they found out that diversity is influencing the quality. And that's it. Maybe you need to dig uh, a bit to know what quality means for them and stuff like that, but once you agree on that, the thing is settled. I know this is difficult and this is not like this, right? But I think that this is the role that we have. It's not writing new models. It's trying to find out for any of these models how to map that to relevant information, like the problem, the project is having this problem or not. But also we have the context of the project, and that's also quite important. And we need to know that many important things happen in the surroundings. So for instance, maybe my project is starting to lose developers, and that's not because I'm doing something bad. That's because there is another project next door with doing, uh, with for any reason, is very sexy now, and everybody goes there. Uh, so th th that's something that doesn't depend on my project. If I'm going to analyze that project, and I'm going to look at the health of the project only, I'm not going to find any reason. What I'm going to find is that the people are living for no apparent reason. If I look at the weather picture, I know people are rushing to that other project for this and this reasons. So that's why analyzing the project is very important. So uh, an example, training, business use, all of that, happen outside the project. If there is no training, for instance, it's very likely that the project is going to be more difficult to use. 
If there is no business interested in the product, very likely there's going to be much less resources. If no people, uh, if nobody is using the product, doesn't matter how well I'm producing it, doesn't matter the quality of the product, basically we're done. Um, as I said before, the interrelations in, in, in large ecosystems are also important. And there is things like competition, cooperation, and coevolution, which is our uh, topics borrowed from uh, biology that are quite relevant here. It's very difficult to understand the history of the free operating systems, for instance, if you don't look at coevolution of all of them. And it's very difficult to understand, I would say, any field in uh, free open source software if you don't look at the whole picture and who were competitors at that moment and who the different companies were positioned and how the different developers came from one project to the other. So in the end, a project in a certain ecosystem have the link of the, pro the health of the, of the project linked to the health of the whole ecosystem. And there is a moral impact. As I said, every of the different components of the ecosystem is influencing the health of the whole ecosystem and the other way around. Again, take the example of Genome. If uh, nobody is using Genome as a tool, none of the applications of Genome are relevant. They are going to lose developers with time, they are going to lose quality, for sure. The other way around, if you have several applications in Genome that everybody wants to use and everybody uses, probably the whole Genome environment is going to be much healthier in the sense that it's going to attract more people, it's going to have more money from companies, etc. Uh, so, attraction of new developers, I already commented about it. Um, common models, I already commented about it. That, that means when I have a common model that is important for the whole ecosystem, but nobody cares or nobody realizes that. So, that means that maybe a single small model is having a big influence in the project. I mean, in, the, in, in all of the different projects, in, in the whole ecosystem. So, that's why also finding which models, which components of the ecosystem have more influence on the whole ecosystem is tricky. Because in many cases, it's not the one with more dependencies, it's not the bigger one, it's not the one, it's the one that has, maybe the one that has a problem, but the problem is critical enough so that nobody wants to use the ecosystem because of that. Another one is availability of skills. Within an ecosystem, usually skills are quite similar, which means that developers can move to, from one project to the other. So if the ecosystem is healthy enough, you are going to have uh, experienced developers around. But maybe my application is performing very well, my, my own project, but the whole ecosystem is not. Which means that if I need more skilled people, I need to look for them outside the ecosystem. And they are not going to be easy to find, or I need to train them to some extent. So that's going to have a, a great impact on how I uh, uh, try to get new people uh, to my project. And of course, marketing and usability usually is something that happens at the whole ecosystem level. If you look at modern large communities like OpenStack or Kubernetes, you realize how important these things are. So many of the companies in Kubernetes, for instance, right now, they have maybe two years. Probably there are things in the industry which are way better because they have been de developing for 10 years. But right now, the attraction that Kubernetes has probably means that the health of those projects is much better than any other health of any other similar product right now, or any other project. And that's not because what they are doing in isolation, that's because what the Kubernetes community is doing. And the same thing happened with OpenStack. When OpenStack started and started to attract a lot of attraction, many people said, don't bother, this component and this company, the OpenStack, are very bad, look at this other system, they have much better components. But since the OpenStack ecosystem attracted so many companies, so many money, so many developers, in like two years, they were basically the dominant thing. And uh, all of the models by in isolation probably were also the best of the of the of the of the combination, just because of the traction that OpenStack had. Well, then uh, how we measure the health again? We need to quantify quality criteria, and this is probably one of the tricky parts, because we want to say which is the quality of the product. Even we need to say things like how is this project inclusive, or how is this project diverse? Putting numbers on that is really difficult. And in many cases, you don't even agree on how to put the numbers, which means the rest of the thing is, is difficult. Once you are having some numbers, I mean, some, some definition which is quantitative of the things that they want, you need to find indicators that summarize the criteria. And you need to find values, 
and you need to track the evolution. Ideally, this is something that the quality model should be providing. Once I've defined it, the configure it, and wherever, I should be defining how to quantify and which indicators are relevant. And then I just run the model. And running the model should be objective. It never is, but it should be objective. Of course, there is a part which is objective, which is running on the different repositories and getting numbers. But remember that in many cases you need expert assessment for some of the things. If you define it well, this uh, quantification of things, probably that's going to be sort of a, 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 a quantitative tool. But the last point usually is to track evolution. You are interested not only in how is the health now, but how is the trend. The trend. And the trend in many cases is much more important and much easier to decide. Because maybe you cannot decide which one is the diversity of this project, but you can say, yes, sir, it is improving or it is not. So that's why tracking over time in many cases is more important than giving a number for today. Uh, an example, you can find, this is a very simple example. You can define for a given project, I want to minimize some fixed errors. So the errors that are in the, in the backlog that were not fixed but are known. So for that, the indicator can be go to the ISO tracker system, find out the bags, and uh, count the unfixed uh, bags. The healthy value could be I want an X number of unfixed bags. Ideally zero, but you know zero is usually not possible, so 20, whatever. Then we have an alarm with the number is more than 20, and we can now, in this month, we improved. Last month we were in 20, now we are in 15. And we don't know if 15 is good enough, but we know that 15 is better than the last month. Of course, if you look at this, you can discuss anything in this list. You can say, well, we, why that is the criteria? Criteria could be anything else. So first of all, you need to agree on that. Second, why are you measuring it this way? Because they, maybe you are interested in the, in the bags that were not fixed and were not found yet. Or maybe you are interested in certain kind of bags or why did you count this as a bag? Just because a developer said that that was a bag? Or go to the issue tracking system. How do you know this is a bag? When you define the healthy value, of course you can say 20 or 30 or 100. Doesn't matter. The idea is zero. You know you cannot reach zero, so you put a number there. And of course you can set the alarm and what to do when the alarm is set. So those are all the different problems that we have when we are defining this. Basically, if you cannot agree in all of these, you don't agree on the results of the model. And agreeing on all, in all of this is, is probably a matter of consensus within a community or consensus within the group of evaluators. Of course, if the person or the institution doing the evaluation is a stakeholder that is basically one person or one criteria and that's clear, there is no problem at all. Of course, if I just want to say this is the standard evaluation for whichever the standard, there is no problem at all. But if you look at the details, you are going to discuss any single line of the standard. Very likely, because you are, don't have it, the, the, the same opinion. So in, in the end, agreeing on the way you measure, from my point of view, is not that important. The important thing is, for some measure that you do, how do you relate that to the real causes and the real problems that you have? If you find a model, the model is not good by itself. The model is good because it works. If you can find out that the model works, and the model really is representing the uh, stakeholder needs that you have, then the model is successful. So my impression is that it doesn't matter too much to discuss on the model. What you need to do is to apply the model and try to see whether the model is working or not. And that's something that, again, we researchers can do. Because the idea is we need to do that for a certain number of projects over a certain different conditions to be sure that we find some evidence that any measure that we are taking is really tell it as something important about the brain. So again, uh, we can do things like, if the project is using code review, the number of unfixed bug reports decreases. Or not. But we can do that kind of analysis. And then we can say, well, if they are using this practice, at least this is decreasing. And if I can link also that to the quality of the project somehow, because I can, I don't know, measure user satisfaction, for instance, that's even much better. So, just to finish, some ideas. So, first of all, when, you are, when we are talking about um, components, remember that no component lives in isolation. And now I'm not talking from the point of view of the ecosystem. Now I'm talking from the technical point of view. It's depending on a lot of other staff. And all of that staff is influencing my, the behavior of my component. 
So dependencies matter. They matter a lot. And dependencies maybe are not in my ecosystem from the point of view of the, the team that works together. Dependencies may be the Linux kernel. Dependencies may be that small uh, security library that we all are using a hands of law, whatever. The overall health is dependent on all the components. In some cases to the extreme that the health is depending on the most, the worst component of the, of the asset. For instance, if I'm evaluating security, usually I'm interested in which are the security flaws of the, uh, of, of the, of the worst component in the system because that's where an attacker is going to try to exploit. And if uh, due to that they can exploit the whole system, I'm done. So in that case, I'm interested not in the medium or in the, in, in the, in the median or whatever, I'm interested in the worst case. In some others, while well, one companies may balance others, depends a lot on what you're doing. And uh, remember also that projects and communities are in the interdependent, which means that if I'm relying on some other software, I'm relying on the community maintaining that software. And uh, so the community maintaining that software becomes important for me. And if I'm a company, for instance, interested in this product, and this product has a dependence on this other product, I'm dependent on the community maintaining this other product. And that's something that I should be uh, aware of. Because if I'm recommending my company, for instance, to use this product because it's very well for our business needs, but don't have into account the other one, well, maybe in the in future we're going to have a lot of trouble because that other product is not maintained well or whatever. Uh, many systems are, in fact, deployed for years, in some cases for tens of years. And you know that once I decide to use something, it's very difficult to change. So many people think of health like the health they have today. But this, I think that's much, much more useful to think, what's a health that likely I'm going to have the next year? So all of us are dependent on that. So we want to be healthy, of course, now, but we also want to be healthy for several years. Hopefully we all are, because if not, we are in trouble. So that's the same thing. If I select something to work with, I need to know what the health of that, of that something for the next years. So we are interested in the trends and pred prediction of, of uh, future health. But that's really difficult. And that's maybe the reason why researchers are not working a lot on that. But for the companies, that's fundamental. Because if I'm taking a component and I'm putting it in a production, and I thought that production is not going to be easy to change during the next 10 years, I'm depending on that product for the next 10 years. So it doesn't matter too much if the product is reliable right now. I, want, I need it to, to be reliable in the future, or at least I need to try to compute the resources that maybe I'm going to need because the product is not maintained in the future, and I need to maintain it because of my customers. Not uh, all the aspects are equally uh, relevant. For example, fixing bags versus uh, new functionality may be something that, depending on the company and depending on the business it may be uh, important to not important. So if I'm developing something right now, and the important thing is the functionality because I'm just building a, 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 a demo of something or whatever that's not going to be maintained, probably functionality is the most important thing. If I'm going to maintain something to stay there in production for years, whatever, have a minimum functionality already, maybe fixing bugs is the most important thing. But this is uh, a bit crazy because in many cases, companies make the decisions based in a demo. And the demo works perfectly with certain components or a prototype. But those components maybe are perfect from the point of view of functionality, and that's why the, the prototype is accepted. But then you need to maintain that, and that's a whole different story. And for that, you need to explore how these different components are going to behave from the point of view of, for instance, banks. Because I'm going to deploy the software, I don't want new functionality because the software is going to be the same all over the life of the, of the, of the production cycle. But I don't want to have banks in the software. And banks are going to happen, so I need them to be fixed. And who is going to fix them? Maybe the project, the project that was very good for functionality is not very good in long-term maintenance of the product. And again, important, we need to understand the dynamics. It's not only like, this is improving like this. We need to know why it is improving. And in the end, we need to, in, to, to understand the internal dynamics of the project. So for instance, if the project is growing because it is sexy, we need to, 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 to have some care. Because maybe in 10 years from now, it's not sexy at all, at all. And the same people that came here because it was very sexy, and I want to say I work with whatever the framework, in 10 years, they are completely uh, away in the next sexy uh, framework. On the other hand, I can look at why companies are supporting this project for the same reason. 
because maybe those companies, when you analyze why they are in the project, you can realize, well, it's very likely that they're going to stay here forever because this is really important for them, they are going to depend on this, whatever. Or the other way around. It's very likely that they are just trying the market, very likely they are going to live here, and, and, and I cannot be confident on that. So understanding the internal dynamics of the communities is really important for doing this prediction. Um, when we are integrating uh, metrics, we can do it from several points of view, but from a point of view, one of the most important areas is, can we integrate metrics in the software development process? So can we inform developers when they are doing the job of how the changes they are doing are influencing the health of the system? So imagine that every time you have a commit, you have a kind of an indicator how that is in, uh, affecting health. Every time you are fixing a bag, you have an indicator of the impact of fixing a bag in the health of the system. Because not all bags are equal, for instance, and maybe security bags everybody knows should come quickly. But what about the rest of the bags? Imagine that you have a way of predicting the importance of fixing this set of bags is crucial for the system right now. Or you look at the numbers every, every day and you see the number of developers that you have and the community itself realizes we are going down in, developer, in, in, the, in the number of developers. Imagine that every developer every week has a very small report saying this week we improved in this and we are getting worse in this. And if you compare month to month or year to year, we are very bad on this and this. That could be a way of developers and companies becoming aware of the, the impact of the work they have on the uh, community. And uh, from some point of view, this is exactly the reason why in open source software we publish the software which is just because anyone can go and look at the software and understand the software. If you think at the same po from the same point of view at the community level, the idea is if you publish the metrics for the community, everybody, including the community itself, can go there, can look at the numbers, and can understand it, especially if you provide that in a way that they can understand, like a simple report that they can read. And then I can, I can drill down into the numbers because I am a member of the community, so I can, I can realize whether I agree with that or not, and I can discuss. But, but you can find out information that usually you are not finding out, again, especially in large communities. Then, we have different stakeholders. So another thing that we can do is to work with different kinds of stakeholders. Remember, we have the people building the software, the developers. We have integrators. Integrators usually work outside the community, but they are also quite important to it, because they are basically making the product useful in other contexts. And you have, of course, users. There is yeah, very little research on how the health, the quality, whatever of the projects affect to integrator and users. Most of the research is related to the relationship between builders, between developers, and health. But what about all of that? And remember one important thing. If there is no users, there is no community. It's a matter of time. And uh, I know why we are not usually dealing with users, because it's difficult. You're dealing with developers, from a research point of view, I mean, it's difficult, while well, they are a certain population, they have a lot of traces in the software open stories, but users are different. There are many of them, I don't know what they are, they are difficult to work with, and uh, there are many. And uh, there are very few studies on, uh, for instance, the perceived health or quality or whatever by users. And if you look at them, usually they are done with a very small sample of users, like 10 or something like that. But uh, for free software communities, the number of users that we have, only the number, is a very interesting indicator. Some projects are already doing this, and they have the products that are giving telemetry to the project, saying basically somebody is using the project right now, so that we can at least know those kind of numbers. And of course, companies are doing that all the time. But in free software communities, that's still very right. In the end, the health of, uh, for different actors is going to be different. Well, this is just marketing. Uh, Tom already talked about chaos. Some of these topics have been dealt with in chaos. In chaos, is, uh, one of the ideas is to put together industry and researchers so that we can try to find out ways of doing all of this. And uh, there are several working groups where, of course, you can participate. And we have also several software for getting data out of repositories so that uh, then you can build metrics in there. And, um, With respect to dynamics, I'm not going to say anything uh, new because I think, uh, well, the, the, the only important thing uh, is remember specific actions are going to impact in the model, so you need to somehow try to define how to do that. And in the end, I wanted to raise this. So from my point of view, we're at the point where we can, have, where we can find 
let's say, a new uh, research framework. And we are researching in this. My, my impression is we can, um, many people are doing this in an informal way or even in a formal way. So first, first of all, we need to define what is health. So what are the goals, the things that I'm interested in in the project? And for this, the best thing is to contact the stakeholders. So to know, for a given kind of stakeholders, what do they want from the project? Then, to find out how to measure the indicators of health. So which indicators are going to be relevant? And then to find, to find an agreement with the stakeholders that those indicators are really relevant for the thing. Or, try to find out research evidence that those indicators really affect the health conditions that you are interested in. Then, try to study how are the deviations. So, what, what would be healthy and what would be unhealthy. Which is like putting thresholds on the numbers. And this is tricky, of course, and depends on many things. But if you can do that, you start to give interesting information. Because you can say, you are over the threshold, so you maybe are entering the trouble. It's like, you have temperature. I don't know what's happening with you, but you have temperature. You should, should go to the doctor, because maybe there is something wrong. Then. We need to learn how to help to go back to healthy. Because saying we are um, unhealthy is interesting, but if we cannot do anything about it, it's, it's not that important. So it maybe it's better that you don't know. Uh, so in the end, what we want is to help the project to come back to healthy. And then we need to say, well, you need to do this and this. And this is a game where research evidence can be quite interesting. So for instance, if bags are scale rocketing for some reason, and you can drill down, and they, that's because of this and this, that has a lot of value, especially if you can provide evidence of that. And in the end, of course, include all of this process into the development process. Because remember, developers themselves are also stakeholders. Well, this is just a, another simple example. So imagine that you want to have no regression, so you write tests, and the indicator is uh, test are failing, deviations, it means all errors appear. So the mitigation is automatic testing. This is already done. So this is one of the examples of how this thing, maybe informally, is already been done. So for testing, they have metrics. And they are trying to find out, problem is, I don't want regressions. And they learn that if they do it the right way, they are not going to, do the to have regression. And that's not because they are doing the software better. That's because they are testing, and they know when a regression happens. And they want to maintain that metric to zero. And they know what to do for that, which is basically not to set the community if it is causing a regression. And then follow the loop. And that's basically continuous integration. So this is one of the cases where projects are integrating metrics in the process, which is very successful. Everybody is using this kind of thing to say. And it's easy to understand. So probably they're using this because it's easy to understand that this is improving the quality of the software. Uh, in the end, remember that we want to go a bit beyond opinions, and we want to, uh, to have facts. And uh, that, that means that we need evidence that the indicator is solving something relevant, and we need to show evidence of mediation. Remember that if we have any problem, we put any policy into place, we still need to uh, find out that the policy really worked. And for that, we can track the same metrics and the same indicators. If we are confident in the indicators, then we can just track the indicators and say, okay, we put some policy in place and the problem is better now, or the problem is worse, and we need to uh, rethink the, the policy. And just, can we do all of this in non-trivial cases? So I think that that's going to research uh, objective for many of us during the next years. Uh, in the end, I think that software health may provide a very good uh, framework for structuring research. And it's like extending software quality, which was the topic uh, some years ago, uh, to a more a broader aspect that can be a, a, a applied, of course, to free open source software, but probably also to popular software in-house. Because many of these things, especially in big companies, are, are, are also things. And in the end, remember, we want to be able to produce actionable outputs. And that's where, as a research community, we need probably to invest more. And uh, that's all. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.